On that point, I think I'd like to open the discussion to the audience assembled here. Uh, so if you could raise your hand if you'd like to ask uh, Ms. Carmen a question. Uh, if you could raise your hand and wait for one of the stewards to bring you a microphone uh, and ask a question, uh, time is now. So if we could start with you over there. Hello, thank you for your speech. I just wanted to ask what your relation with kind of your work towards promoting the rights of women in, in particularly your area has to do with kind of the dismantling of tyranny? Is there a relation between the two projects or are they completely separate? Sorry, I couldn't hear you very That's well. That's okay, I'll repeat And speak it. slowly if sure. you don't mind. No problem. Um, in Yemen especially, is there a relation between your work to promote the rights of women and your work to try and counter dictatorships and tyranny? Mm. Yeah, very big relationship. Very, um, look, when I started my journey for freedom and against a you know, dictator, I started as a woman. So some people think that to be woman in a conservative uh, society, that kind of weakness. But for me, I think that that was one of my strengths, you know, one of my power as a woman. Yes, I had a lot of a lot of you know, difficulties around me, a lot of uh, first you know, difficulties from the dictator and his regime. Um, and he, he made a lot of, you know, create a lot of, you know, def uh, a lot of uh, rumors, a lot of, uh, they, they defame my reputation, they put me in prison, they attack me, they um, enter to my house, uh, destroy things, steal. They made a lot of, you know, violence against me. And also from the social part, you know, from the traditional, you know, and, you know, and, uh, you know, side, you know. But I, at that time, I was, you know, very convinced that, okay, Every time he attacked me, he will make me more strong. And every time that the, the traditional society doesn't accept me, that also will make me strong because I will convince them that I deserve to be one of your uh, leaders, to be the one who help you on dream for your freedom and democracy. And to be a woman, that was strange. To be a woman in the street alone, calling people for, to wake up, calling people for, um, uh, to be active, to be against the dictator, that was first woman. Second, she, you know, she, she, uh, she has that strong uh, voice. It was really, really strange and um, really weird, but that, in, you know, provoked the people to follow. Oh my God, what is she doing? Some of them uh, laugh, some of them attack, and most of them they follow. They said, oh, she's doing. And I remind them with our great, you know, uh, uh, queen, queen of Bilqis. And they call me, oh, our second queen, Bilqis, she's our second. So to be woman, from a society like Yemen, it is not weakening, it is strengthening. But I should you know, know how the way to make the people to believe on me. And that is not just me, Tawakkul in Yemen, and you as women everywhere. You should believe on yourself. And if you want people to convince on your leadership, be in the front line and don't afraid if they, from the consequences. If they, will, if they love today, tomorrow they will be with, me, with you. If they attack you today, tomorrow they will uh, be with you. And I will give you one story. And I didn't say it, I just said last week in, um, in Harvard. I remember in one of my demonstrations, I was in the demonstration and returning from Sana'a University to my house. And walking to my house, and there was a one uh, has, you know, I don't know how can I say it in English, a big, like a big, uh, big knife. And he was threatening me that he will kill me. And he followed me, he followed me until he re reached to me. And I said, okay, 
kill me if you can. And I put my neck on him, okay, kill me. And he dropped one, two, three, and then he stopped and tried to cry. And he stopped, he said, no, I can't. So leadership is this, facing your fears, facing your fears and dealing with people with love, telling people by act and by words that you work with them and you work for them. Um, if we could take the second question from uh, you in the front row. Thank you very much for your remarks. You mentioned the Security Council, and uh, I was wondering whether you think that considering Russia, China, and America sit on it, will there ever be a legal basis for the kind of humanitarian intervention you want when they are all supporting different dictators in the region? Unfortunately, the fifth countries in the Security Council, they don't do their responsibility on protecting human security. The Security Council itself established for this area, for this field, for this goal to protect human security, to be the tool of people to prevent any kind of wars against them. But unfortunately, four of them, they use their seats in the Security Council to just to fulfill and also to, 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 uh, to, uh, uh, to fulfill their, you know, their interests. Russia, America, uh, China, Britain, who else? Uh, France. So all of them. When the, it came, it doesn't, you know, the, yeah, but the most, you know, the most, you know, one who, Yani doesn't use it in a, in a, in a, in a who use it in a wrong way, so, you know, uh, China, Russia, Russia and America, not China, Russia and America. So I don't believe that they use it in a very good way, in a good way, in a very good way. But we should, we should, we shouldn't, you know, um, give up on this very important tool. It is our tool, the Security Council, the United Nations need a lot of reforms a lot of reforms to make it effective to serve people in the world. So it needs a lot of, even with this, you know, this kind of the council, security council that vote the vetoes of the, of the five country, I think it is unfair, uh, you know, procedures. We should work on make, you know, reforms on that. But also, if we couldn't, from other hand, so we, our fight, our fight, the human rights activists around the world, to fix and to make reforms for Security Council, for UN, and also for International Criminal Court, by the way. It has a lot of, you know, obstacles. For example, International Criminal Court cannot suit any war criminal around the world. They have just two ways. If the file come to them from Security Council, or if the country itself, you know, sign on the um, agreement. Uh, of the uh, inter, uh, Roma, you know, and the International Criminal Court Agreement, but it, it is not like that. Most of the most of the criminals, they, their countries, you know, doesn't you know didn't uh, sign on the agreement of the International Criminal Court. So our international tools to prosecute the war criminals should be effective. Should be effective by making reforms, and we should do that. We should believe in ourselves on making this demand, you know, uh, uh, to be there, to achieve, you know, our goal on that. If we could take the next question from a uh, gentleman sat over there. Yep. Is it this one? Okay. Uh, thank you for coming. I just was curious about some comments that you made about the involvement of Saudi Arabia and the UAE, especially in Yemen. And I wonder whether you think that the Saudi uh, that the UAE and Saudi Arabia would have gotten involved in Yemen in such uh, an aggressive way had Iran not gotten involved in countries like Syria, in Yemen, and Iraq at around the same time. Look, um, 
Yes, there is war between Saudi and Iran, and there is kind of proxy war in some countries. But the reality that all these countries, they have one goal, to destroy the peaceful revolution, to destroy Arab Spring, to destroy the aspiration of people to have their democracy, freedom, and accountability. Either in Syria by Iranian regime, and also Saudi and the Emirates in indirect way, or in, in Yemen by Saudi and Emirates by their direct you know, uh, involvement and indirect involvement by Iran. So all of them, they don't want democracy. So they, if they want to divide the countries between them, if they, for us, that you should know that the war there in that region, if it take the image of Saudi Emirates, Iran, but there is, it's another war, the real war. Or even it's, you know, it takes sectarian war between Sunni and Shia in some in Iraq or in uh, uh, some you know, countries, especially in Iraq. So if it's take, it, but the, this is, this is some, something to cover the real war. The real war is between those dictators and the international powers back then and between those people who fight for their democracy and freedom. So then they said, it's Iran, it's, no, it is not Iran, Saudi, it is something else that, because people in Iran also, they want democracy and freedom. And if people take their freedom and democracy in Iran, in Saudi, in Yemen, in Emirates, and absolutely this kind of war and competition between Saudi and Iran and Emirat and then it will stop. But they don't want it. They don't want it. I think we'll take the final question uh, for today from uh, the lady sat in the, in the front row over there. Hello. Um, my question is about um, your involvement in the Arab Spring. Um, so you are one of, well, one of the most prominent activists in Yemen. I'm interested in whether it was seen in the, in the Middle East as um, a unified movement in the different countries that experienced the Arab Spring. Um, and did the activists from this, these countries have, um, did they have discussions and did they have some kind of um, unified vision of what democracy could look like in the Middle East? Look, uh, the activists uh, from the beginning, from 2011, they decided to reach to the final goal. What is the final goal? It is a democratic country, a real democratic country, because some of our countries that was called as a democratic countries, while it's a fake democratic countries, the dictator used it just you know, for, you know, uh, for propaganda that he's a democrat while he you know, put most of the opponents in the prison or he denied the press freedom, etc., etc. So the final goal, the final goal was democracy, was uh, transparency, was accountability, was equality. So these you know, goals uh, was you know, defined, prosperity, this, this was defined. And now, how can we do it? How can we do it? There was steps. The first step is tabling the dictator. So tabling the dictator was not our final step. It is just a step of our great journey to a democrat country. So after tabling the, the dictator, we know as activists, as a people who led this revolution from all the countries and from many sides, many colors, many parties, you know, that what is the shape of the country that we want? And we enter to the transitional period. In the transitional period, we discussed how the shape of the city, uh, uh, country, how the constitution should be. So as we were one voice against the dictator, in the, the second 
term in the second step with inside the transitional period, this is the differences came from the activists. How the city, how the, how, what the kind of democratic country that we want. And because of that, you see some differences happened in some countries. And that will also, these differences, unfortunately, in some cases, yani being used by the military coups, by the counter revolutions. So they didn't, you know, they didn't, they didn't um, become, you know, a one voice for, you know, the constitution that we want, the uh, laws that we should write. But also with that, they committed some mistakes, not a crime, some mistakes. So when the activists in the transitional period has differences on how to write the constitution, should we make the, should we write the constitution first or should we make the election first? So these, you know, differences make a big, you know, arguments between the, the activists. And unfortunately, in some cases, like what happened in Egypt, it led to the military coup. But in Yemen, we were one voice. And we did a great national dialogue between all the parties, parties, uh, syndicates, and even the party of the uh, dictator, you know, um, the, uh, uh, the dictator, even the party, his party, we didn't exclude him. Even the militia, we put all the people on one table for nine months, we did a great dialogue, and we achieved a great uh, draft of constitution. Then the coup happened by support from Saudi Emirates and, and Iran. In Tunis, in Tunis, they did a great work. In Libya, they did a great work before Haftar came and been supported by some of the, you know, by, by Emirates and by the, uh, some of the Western governments. So it's still, in transitional period, there is many differences, but how to manage these differences? The good revolutionary people should make these differences to be less, but it shouldn't justify military coup or wars or militia coups. It doesn't because it is just political mistakes. So to wrap up the event today, uh, I'd just like to reiterate what a deep honor it is for us to be hosting you today thank at you. the Cambridge Union. Thank uh, you. And if the audience could join me in, once again, a warm round of applause to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.